Rob Garber, were you at the, um, did you watch the live stream or did you attend when um, Jared James talked about the lifetime value of a client? Um, I think it was two years ago at R4. Yeah, I think I, I think I did. And, and actually, I also um, taught a class online to the company uh, a year or so ago about Realtor for Life. Right. And do and you recall approximately what that lifetime value of a client is? It, roughly. Um, I, I don't remember the number that he used. used $117,000. Based okay. on all the all the transactions that uh, a client will do, and um, you know, one of the things that he talked about was, you know, um, and I'm going to read the stats, and these are from 2021, so I, I'm working off of a year old stats. I didn't update it, but 88 percent of buyers um, purchase their home through a real estate, six percent directly from a builder. Uh, 73% only used one, only interviewed one agent and 91% of the buyers um, gave a, uh, an excellent or a good uh, customer satisfaction rating and said that they would use that client again, yet less than 18% of them actually do use the same agent the second time. So, <clears throat> you know, I know in our organization, I'm sure our numbers are substantially higher uh, because we shy away from part-time agents and uh so assuming that you know let's just say that 95 percent, 19 out of 20 are satisfied uh, i'm sure we don't avoid the um, breakage between repeat users and the satisfied customer and today's session is to talk about how do we how do we leverage that one statistic that doesn't cost us anything okay and i'm a I'm a big fan of the work that Napoleon Hill did, and it's not his own uh, material. What he did is studied the most successful people in the industrial age, that's the early, mid-1900s, and he found commonalities between them and what helped people um, succeed and thrive at, at levels that were unheard of by anyone else. And <clears throat> the starting point um, that he identified when he did his research was having a definiteness of purpose, meaning that you weren't wishy-washy about what you were going to do. Um, you know, the starting point of all achievement is defining a definiteness of purpose without a purpose and a plan, people drift aimlessly through life. Um, when we all like give a shake of the head, if you're on the camera, that makes a whole lot of sense. Like if you don't really have a goal, you're never going to get there because you don't know where you're going. Right. And you have to have that inner conviction. And I think, you know, if you look at some of your peers um, and in the company and even in the industry, can we all think of somebody who, if we get an offer from that person, we're like, ah, oh, these never go smooth. They always have um, bumps and they rarely close. Can And Frank, as a lender, I see you on there. Like, do you have some clients that, some realtors that you choose not to work with because none of their deals close? Uh, yeah, there's definitely some of those out there. <laughs> so, so I used to, you know, naively think early on in my career that, that this thing called luck had an influence on what happens. But I, I'm fairly confident that luck is not what drives the outcome, that it's that certainty, the definiteness of purpose, you know, the tenacity to continue through, which, you know, makes those transactions happen. So <clears throat> you have the, the definiteness of purpose is like the starting point. The second thing is, um, and this is my paraphrasing, the realtor who does more than she is paid for will soon be paid for more than she does. We must always go the extra mile. You must give before you get. Okay, that's a paraphrase on one of Napoleon Hill's principles. But does that does that make any sense? And does anybody want to, you know, maybe share what that means to you? I'll read it again. The realtor who does more than she is paid for will soon be paid for more than she does. They always go the extra mile and you must give before you get. Does that mean anything? Does anybody want to, you know, paraphrase what that means to them? 
And I know that, mean, that means uh, giving extra service. Uh, if your client, uh, to help your client uh, declutter if necessary. Uh, the other thing would be to community service, to be involved in the community, to give back, uh, to share uh, like events, uh, to uh, maybe support a uh, so, soccer team or, you know. So maybe you're going a little deeper um, okay. or, or wider. Wider, um, yeah. <laughs> but but so, so um, I guess what, um, looking at here is, you know, when you have a home buyer or a home seller before us, right, and we agree to work together, what is the goal of that relationship? And I think that's kind of the the foundation that I'm looking to question here. Um, and Colleen, would you say that a lot of times if there's a, a, a listing opportunity, we go into somebody's house, the goal is just to get that house sold, get a fair commission and put that money in the bank? Uh, yes. <clears throat> now, what if we thought about that opportunity as an opportunity to have somebody who gets exceptional service, right, unparalleled, they tell all their friends and family, and they would never consider not using us for a future transaction? Perfect. Is that a little bit different from going out there, being honest, being competent, getting the job done? Even getting a five-star review is probably not enough, Okay. We, we, I agree with you. And and we're all spending money advertising, trying to attract people, right? That we have to chase instead of, you know, really spending that time and, you know, giving more than what's expected, going that extra mile without any additional pay. And, and it might be without additional pay for this particular transaction, but over the lifetime, that relationship is going to pay dividends that you never imagined. And if you want to be extraordinary, which is extraordinary, okay, do you think we can be extraordinary if we do the same thing that everybody else does? No. Uh, and I think, like you said in one of our uh, other sessions, to go back after the closing, 10 days, check and see how everything is doing, uh, if there's anything you can help them with. Anything uh, that they need, they want to know about the neighborhood, have coffee with them. That's going that extra mile also because it's showing you care about them. You've already collected your commission. <laughs> yep. So so it's not just about that transaction. It's about the uh, totality of the relationship. Paul, do you have your hand raised or is that a... Yeah, I do. Thanks, Rob. Um, for me, I give the kind of service that I want to get whether it's past or present clients. And this applies to any kind of interaction. Something as simple as uh, why you may have a favorite uh, hairstylist or you go to a particular supermarket. I kind of, I, it's not, it's kind of like the golden rule. You know, if, if I have given my clients all that I can and I continue to do that, uh, I feel like that's how I want to be treated. And I hope next time around they think, oh, okay, well, let's give Paul a call. He just sent us information on the school district's latest whatever. So for me, it's just something as simple as serve your clients the way you want to be served. So can I, I want to share an example that's not related to this, which just happened this morning. And I'm going to, I'm going to share my screen because I think this is relevant to how human nature is. Oops, Fred, you've disabled my uh, ability to share. Are you still on? Right. Make sure Fred or, or uh, Maria, do you have the uh, host? I'm going to try. Hold on. So while, while we're trying to get through this technical difficulties, um, so I'm going to... If I could just... All right, I just <laughs> made your host, Rob. Go ahead, Robert. I just, uh, just um, an example of, of what I did, I made a decision at, at the early stages of working with one of my clients that um, after having listened to them about what was going on in their family and 
what they were thinking about for the future uh, on the second house that I helped them buy. Um, I knew that his mother was a realtor in California and she would have been ill and unable to work. And I suggested that for the next two transactions that I did with my clients, I would pay her a referral fee of 25% for the next two transactions. They were floored by that offer and that those clients now have contributed over $300,000 in commissions to me over 13 transactions. Now, now somebody might have said to you, boy, that's silly, Robert. She didn't really refer these people to you, but you made a decision that was going above and beyond um, looking at the lifetime value or the value of the relationship, not just the transaction. Correct. So who would like to have, and how much were the two referrals? Uh, they, I don't know, they were probably, you know. Uh, 7,000, 10,000 total, right? About, about, no, it was probably, they might have made as much as 10,000 each one. Uh, 10,000 each one, and you got 300,000. So who would, who would spend 20 grand to get 300,000? I think most of us would. And um, and Robert, I'll bet you that that number that you're giving is just the direct, like the direct tree of the business. And it's amazing how many times people come to Colleen, you or I, and say, you know what? <clears throat> From that one Zillow lead I got where I had to pay the referral fee, I got nine other transactions because I really made an impression on that person. Have you had that happen, Robert? Absolutely. I mean, these people... Um... They referred me to uh, one of their, she's an interior designer. She referred to me to one of her clients. She called me at four o'clock in the morning to tell me that this client of hers had found a house that they wanted to buy and they needed me to help them with the transaction. And I had to call them by seven <clears throat> o'clock in the morning, which I did. And I met them at the house that evening and they bought it for $2.2 million dollars. And I ended up selling their present house for a million too. Wow. I'm going to mute everybody and then just unmute yourself to talk. So, um, yeah, so so it's not just the immediate transaction. It's the it's the re relationship. And we have a lot that I want to go through. I know, did, Colleen, did you have something to contribute here before I go on? No, I think we covered it pretty well. I, I love what Robert said. That showing compassion and the fact that he he cared about them, especially because she was ill and couldn't work. I mean, it's really perfect. So let me uh, let me put this up here. I gotta find my. Hey Rob. Yep. While you're while you're doing that, um, one of our associates, Shante, gave me a uh, recommendation of a book. The Seven Levels of Communication. Um, I don't know if anybody's read it or listened to it, but it really uh, plays along uh, really well with your topic today. Um, it's a very easy read, um, and it's a easy, if you do Audible, it's even easier. Um, it's called but the, I think the, the, the Seven Levels of Communication? Yes. Um, just a, a really great book. Um, I think you guys would enjoy it. It's an easy read. It's great if you're uh, traveling and you want to listen to it or otherwise. It's, um, Chante gave it to me, great book. So so here's, here's my uh, experience outside of the um, real estate world, which is um, relevant. And I, I want to just share, so, I, I had a, um, we have our own insurance company, we insure. So I took my insurance policies, I moved them out of my insurance broker. And I, I found out that I had a claim from somebody who fell in front of a property in December of 2020, two years and three months ago. And I'm like, all right, I call my agent from the time who I no longer work with, like they're not my agent anymore. And I say, can you, can you help me start this claim and give me the information? So I file the claim and the uh, underwriter or the insurance company says, oh, because it wasn't on your property, we're going to decline coverage. You have to defend it yourself. I've been doing this a long time and I know that 
I don't believe that to be accurate. So I asked him for some help. And this guy who is a customer service rep did the research and, and sent me an email at 6.40 and then at 6.52 a.m. this morning to help me resolve this problem. And I was so blown away that I went to him and, you know, I, I really told him I appreciated it. And I asked him, is there anything that I can do? Because this is really above and beyond. And he said, do a, a review on uh, Zillow, which I submitted this review this morning. I gave him a five-star review. And I said, I worked with Phil of World Insurance Associates on a claim. And he is the most knowledgeable and responsive representative I ever worked with. He provided me with all the documents needed and went well above and beyond what a client could expect, including responding to my email before 7 a.m. Thank you, Phil. Right. So not only did I did that, do that, I went to him and I said, is there anyone else at your company that I can share this with? Because I'm really impressed. So he, he promptly gave me back two people to share that with. Now, I think it's the right thing to do. Does anybody relate to that? Right. I mean, I, I did that because it was the right thing to do. I was really impressed that somebody who like is a customer service rep, not a salesperson, went above and beyond like, you know, a lot of times there's an inflection point. Somebody would say, this guy's a pain in my butt. He no longer is a client and he wants me to, to do him a favor, right? Have you ever felt that experience from, uh, you know, a situation, right? Because I, I no longer work with that company because I have my own brokerage. Yet this guy went above and beyond and I was being a little bit demanding, a little bit, you know, persistent. And I did that because I wanted to do it. And I asked him, who can I share with? Because I wanted to share that, even though, you know, I'll probably never do business with them again, but I will probably, you know, refer them if there's something that we can't handle. And I did give him an honest five-star review. That's probably going to help him out. That's an example of like kind of go, what going above and beyond will do for you. You know, he didn't ask me to do it. I said, what can I do to help you? So um, there's a non-real estate example that literally just happened this morning. Um the Maybe next you can hire him for our insurance company. I'm sorry? Maybe you can hire him for our insurance company. Yeah, maybe I can do that. It's a great idea. <laughs> I'll butter him up, then I'll hire him. But but my motivation wasn't to do that. My motivation no, just was, it was just like one of gratitude, right? I appreciate like, you know, you call an 800 number, you get bounced around. Nobody wants to help you, right? When you're buying something, everybody wants to jump on you. When you need help, everybody's like, oh, leave a voicemail here, do this, do that. So very impressed with uh, the service he did. The next thing I wanted to say is, how much does it cost to have a pleasing personality when you're going through life? I mean, you can choose to be you know, frustrated and negative, or you can choose to have a pleasing personality, right? And does it cost you anything? And if you're not a curmudgeon and you're... Um, even if situations happen, even people do things that frustrate us, you know, you can still have a pleasing personality back. And to be honest with you, even if it doesn't benefit you in that relationship, you have a better life when you're happy, right? Like if you're frowning and negative versus having a pleasing personality, it's a benefit to us. And you know what? People want to be around people who make lemonade out of lemons, right? They're, they're not talking about it. Hey, Robert, this person, uh, they tried to rip me off and they made an offer behind, like, you know, there's enough negativity out there. Let's just focus on the positive and let's focus on how we can attract people because no matter what, we're always going to be, po we're always going to be positive. Like nobody can change the way you feel, right? The only person that can change the way that you feel and the emotions you have is yourself, right? I mean, you can be in a horrible situation and you can find something positive in that situation. And then that will be something that defines us. I don't know if that may, maybe, maybe, you know, maybe it's resonating, maybe it's not. But I, I really think that, you know, when you're positive, when you have that, I'm going to figure it out or, you know, um, you know, Colleen, I don't know the answer now, but I'll get, I'll get back. Like, that integrity, that positive attitude is something that is just magical. And then we talked I think, about- Sorry to interrupt, but I think even in business in general, that's important. Um, for example, our Fred, 
every time I call him or text him, it's an emergency. I'm just, you know, Henny Penny. Uh, the sky is falling kind of person sometimes. And he is always respectful. He always makes me feel so much better because I feel guilty how much I drive him crazy. Um, and I do. I know I do. And he's always, and I can see, I, you know, I can't see Fred, but I can see the smile. I can feel it, you know, and his enthusiasm to help. And it makes a difference. It makes a huge difference. <clears throat> it actually makes you feel good. So from the other side, like you with the insurance agent, um, I think that's, you know, that's a huge, huge factor. Yep. So, so, um, and, and Fred is, uh, I agree with you. He's a, uh, um, a really positive committed individual. And, uh, I do share the same sentiment that you have. <clears throat> the next, the next thing is a, a Rob quote, because I've, I've observed what, what happens in this business. I observe the journey. I look at, you know, sometimes how much we do and sometimes how, um, we might want to feel slighted okay we might want to feel somebody did something that um that wasn't right and, and i have the urge to be disappointed or angry but i think that this will change the the narrative um you must give an extraordinary experience before you can experience extraordinary growth or because before you can even experience an extraordinary life right um, and if the goal when we sit in front of a buyer, seller, renter, landlord, whatever the client is, is to deliver an ex memorable experience, right? And, and that memorable experience might just be, you know, we had a positive attitude the whole way, right? We, we had um, some humility if something goes wrong and, and we just go that extra mile. And then we earn the right if we even... Um, need to ask, but a lot of times I'm just be recognizing what value, what tremendous value we've delivered, and um, they'll go out of their way to be big, raving, supporting fans of ours. Right? So, so... Add to that, Rob, that this also applies to um, your interaction <clears throat> with other agents. If you have that same feeling... Um, and it starts to uh, impair your ability to really get along with another agent, it's important to make sure that you do what you can to overcome that because down the road, it's more important to have friends than enemies. Now, you know, <clears throat> that's really, um, that's, that's a significant statement you said there, Robert. And um, I will share with you um, the sentiment that I experienced when. I don't know if it's about eight months ago or maybe uh, yeah, probably about eight months ago. I want to say maybe April or May of last year. Um, I was helping somebody who um, was out due to medical, uh, a medical condition. And I went and I gathered all the offers on the property. And I'm like, there's going to be like 45 people that are really disappointed. There's going to be half of those agents are going to think that I dealt from the bottom of the deck. If they don't get the offer, um, let me ask somebody who's not contributed so far. If a client, if a, an agent doesn't get an offer accepted on a hot property, you know, what do you think their first inclination is to think? Anybody want to chime in there? You screwed them. And, 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 I, and I did what? offer to make yours. I, they use they use they use their offer to get my offer accepted. I think that I think that there is an inherent belief in that that you know he probably has he or she probably has their own offer and you know um, they really you know didn't present mine fairly, right? So here's something that I did that got an overwhelmingly positive response that wasn't particularly convenient. Is um, I went to the uh, homeowner's property. I brought the offers printed out and I had them uh, initial right where the price was and right declined 45 times. And then I took a picture of that um, initial and writing declined 
and sent it to everybody. And the people were blown away because they didn't have to ask me. I just went and said, hey, you know what? I presented the offer. Unfortunately, we had uh, multiple offers and she didn't want to go back and forth. But here, here's her initialing it. They were like blown away, positive feedback. And now if I need to work with any of those 45 agents in the future, do you think I'm going to have a little bit of an easier time, even though they didn't get the deal done? And what usually happens is that, you know, 40, 25 people are, are feeling that they got the short end of the stick. Two of them actually say, hey, can you get an acknowledgement that you presented the offer from them because my client doesn't believe it was presented, right? So I, I think that that's, you know, I don't know if that was you, Robert, that said that, um, that brought that up, but that's a huge piece, right? Because our reputation is not just with the clients. Our reputation is how do we, you know, how do we conduct ourselves within the business? You know, in the, in the heat of the moment, Rob, I had an agent who was very, a big agent in, uh, Mountain Lake. Get an X. She didn't get that one X. And I, I got into an argument with her over a transaction. Yeah, for some reason it didn't go through. Uh, I just mute, Robert, unmute yourself now. I just uh, muted everybody. Okay, so I, I, I got into this argument with another agent, um, and uh, it got fairly heated, which I felt really bad about. And I actually took the time to call her back and apologize for the way that I had spoken and and the level to which, you know, our confrontation had gotten. And over the years, uh, she and I did several more transactions going forward, and there was never an issue um, over anything during those transactions. <clears throat> Could have been terrible because she was one of the top agents in my area where I was doing business. And and even though you compete with that person, doesn't it serve both of you to have a, a good professional, uh, honest working relationship, right? Absolutely. That's that's why I, I took the time to call her back and apologize, even though I wasn't the only protagonist in the argument. Yep. So, so it, you know, it's not just the buyer, seller, landlord, tenant that we need to build a strong relationship with is we need to have a positive experience within the real estate community so we can be more effective at delivering results for our clients. If that doesn't resonate, maybe that's something that we know, but we never put in the front lobe of our mind to think about, right? Because sometimes we're so busy, right? It would be easy, Robert, for me just to go through, have all of them signed put them on a pile, give them to the agent, say, hey, I did all this, and not take a picture and text that to the um, the agent making the offer, that would be very easy. And then we might get a couple of complaints that might go through to the agent or the manager, and then we'd have to dig it up and send it out. I think it's almost easier for me to be proactive in the way you address it than to be reactive when somebody complains. Because once they complain, you know, they're going to think that I just signed that, right? Uh, I don't even believe it. They probably just signed it and signed it themselves and sent it to me just to make me go away. Because I know we've all had that feeling. So thank you for sharing that. Um, so if we redefine the goal or the objective of, of a uh, client interaction from a commission check to giving a extraordinary experience that's worthy of extraordinary referrals, worthy of extraordinary growth for us. I think that changes the, the narrative completely because it's so hard to get a qualified trusting client, right? To list or sell a property. And, you know, we're leaving a abundant opportunity on the table. We really are. So if instead of, you know, spending time, you know, sending emails that people aren't going to open or, um, doing some activity that's not going to provide that added value. If we were just to repurpose, you know, an hour a week to make sure that that transaction is above and beyond what anyone could have ever expected, right? And then we build in, I think we talked about it a week or two ago about like uh, having the appropriate process for asking for referrals, right? We built that in because we were exceeding the, the standard, we're exceeding the expectations that, hey, 
you know, Robert, who do you know that I can, um, who do you know that you can um, refer me to that I can possibly help, right? It makes it a lot easier when you have that extraordinary experience. And somebody mentioned uh, earlier on in the call, like having the, um, the courtesy and the compassion to stop by after they close the house. Like how many agents do you think when they close the house, like they never look back? You know, Robert, you've managed for a while. When you say it's more than 80% of the agents that don't take a visit after they moved in, they just yes. move Absolutely. on to trying to make another sale, right? Yes, absolutely. But what if you what if you made it a habit to visit, you know, two weeks afterwards with a little pop by or a little something that shows that you care? And maybe even, you know, three months and every year. I mean, nobody has that many clients, or it's very few of us that have that many clients that we couldn't visit them once a year and drop off something that costs two to five dollars to show, hey, I was just thinking about you, right? And by the way, do you know anyone else I could help, right? So that's what I'm talking about, giving that extraordinary experience. Um, it costs you nothing to, to choose to be pleasing and positive as opposed to being disappointed and negative. There's no cost to that whatsoever. And to be honest, you probably live longer and have a more uh, fulfilling career if you choose to face adversity from a positive lens instead of a, uh, a victimized lens, right? <clears throat> We talked about $117,000 as the lifetime value of one client. Um, uh, this is some of the things that I wrote down in the past. Once a client, always a client. I would avoid the term past clients because that almost means that they're no longer, you know, are they're no longer working with us, right? So if they have a real estate need, a past client doesn't call us but a client does call us. Um, so um, <clears throat> let's see, serving clients is the foundation of our decision-making process, right? Not marketing. So like once you build some clients, you know, those, those satisfied clients that we keep in touch with can yield a heck of a lot more than, than you know, doing it just listed, just sold, doing uh, farm mailing. I mean, don't get me wrong, farm mailing is good, but you have to prove yourself over and over again. And a past client is, you know, it's almost priceless. Um, I think when, you know, and, and this is sadly not for the people that's on this call, uh, there's a, uh, a term called can I, which is constant, never ending improvement. And you know, time is the friend of the wonderful business and the enemy of the mediocre mediocrity, which is, um, and that's a, a Warren Buffett quote, by the way, because over time, when you run a good business, it, it produces a yield. And if you run a, a mediocre business, you're just fighting an uphill battle. It's like you're rowing upstream. Um, you know, communication is power. Um, those who master effective use and the uh, art of communication will be the, the winners. All behaviors and feelings have their original roots in some form of communication. So, you know, the the takeaway here is if we do a good job, but we don't share what's being done in the process, um, we're missing out on an opportunity to be appreciated more for what we do. And I'm not saying we need to say everything that we do, but sometimes clients don't understand what happens behind the scenes in the real estate business. Um, you know, I'm just going to call on Mr. Eric. I see you're there. I don't know if you're able to talk, but do you think sometimes clients take for granted that all we do is put a sign in the ground, put an ad in the, on Zillow and market it, and voila, a big commission check coming Eric's way? Yeah, so they think. I, I'm here. Oh, Eric's. oh, I thought it was Eric Funk. All right, I'll, I'll cut that off. No worries. What's your Eric, Ron? So we'll go, Eric. Well, I'm going to ask you both, but we'll go Eric Pruitt first, Eric Funk second. So are you a Tony Robbins graduate? What's that? Are you a Tony Robbins graduate? 
Uh, I I am a big Tony Robbins fan. Yes. So that, no, Kanai. Is that where you got Kanai from? Yes, that is. Yeah, me too. He great. I went to his Bassett University. Very good summer. Very good program. Yeah, if you don't let the sellers know what you're doing, that's what they think you're doing nothing to earn the commission. So we always try to keep them informed of what's going on, give them weekly feedback, and let them know. And, and Eric, in New Jersey, it's standard practice, like when a contract is submitted, um, what does the uh, seller's attorney normally send out? Uh, I'm going to ask Eric Funk. What does the letter normally say um, when it goes into attorney review? Usually says that they would like to uh, negate this contract in its entirety, however, move forward if you agree to the following. Correct. So it's like, oh, my God, they're killing the contract. Then it says, oh, but yep. we will move forward if you accept these changes. Now, that doesn't, that doesn't happen in in Florida, as I understand, Eric. We don't have that problem here. But, but I mean, th that's a communication. Like, if, if, the, if the buyer gets that communication or the seller says, oh, my attorney killed the deal because they didn't have the right expectation, I'm sure, Eric Funk, that's created some... Um, some panic calls over your career, right? Until they understand what that means. We usually explain that to them right up front. Okay. But when you were a rookie, maybe you forgot once and they were like, oh my God, the deal is dead, Eric. What's going on? Uh, and then that's fine. Then you've learned the communication part of it where they now understand what the expectation is. And I'm Which, sure, Eric, good. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Funk. Did you want to say something, Eric, or no? I would, I would just say that, you know, we try to um, build up all the expectations that are coming, and that's one of the few things that comes up that they, um, they might not understand right off the bat, but when they see the letter, they appreciate us explaining it to them, and they don't feel foolish. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, think, I think it's easy, uh, interesting, though. Now I see why we get so much feedback or kickback from people from the Northeast or New Jersey when they think, when we tell them they don't need an attorney. Yep, mm -hmm. it's it's the norm. Yeah. Um, and and uh, Eric, this, is, this kind of ties into our Monday peer-to-peer, uh, -peer, but who took that good, who took that great picture of you in front of the peacock? <laughs> uh, Rob, that has defined my level of communication right there. I want to tell you that that picture that you took of me while we were door knocking has actually surfaced yesterday when I called a client on that street and she says, oh, I remember you. And that was the that was right in front of our house. I said, oh, you're the one with the peacock. And <laughs> sure enough, she's looking right now for a house and wants to put her house on the market. As, and that's what, about over a year ago, right, Mark? Right. I think I think it was uh it was a year in the summertime, right? So it's like a it was, year in yeah. the half, maybe. Maybe exactly. So you can see that these things, you know, you put these seeds down and they remember you if you you know, if you have something that they remember, let's put it that way. Yeah, so. that, that was one of the most unique experiences. I'm like, ma'am, do you know that there's a peacock in your yard? Yes, we do. Okay. Yes, it was funny. Um, so uh, uh a little plug for um Monday session, um, and in my preparation for it, I have defined, you know, four strategies for door knocking with different um, connection techniques, and I'm not quite sure what my favorite is. I think my favorite is going to be farming, where you door knock in the farm and you become the mayor of that farm or that area. Um, but it's really close to open, like pre-open house door knocking, which is like ninja skills. Um, those are the best door knocking activities. And, you know, if I were doing an open house, I would spend all day Saturday and I'd put the signs out Sunday morning and probably 10 o'clock, I'd be door knocking the neighborhood and uh, have a change of clothes and then do my open house because it's going to be that powerful. People love to talk about properties in their neighborhood that are coming on the market and you have instant relevance and instant significance when you door knock um, into a community where you're doing an open house or have an active listing. Eric, did you have a comment on that? Eric Funk, I see you. Um, 
No, you know, I think it's, you know, if you're personable, which we're all, we all are, we're in this business, stay connected with your clients and, you know, ask for reviews and be in the know. But I will tell you, Rob, I do have a particular question that may not be related to this, but lately I've been hearing a lot about chat GPT technology, which I have no idea what it is, but I do understand that it's something that's being used, um, you know, to drive, uh, drive positive uh, expectations, positive reviews, all of that kind of stuff, and maybe help us out. Do you have any, can you shed any light on, on that and how it relates to our business? Uh, I, I'm not the expert on that. I don't know if any of our, uh, any of our audience here is use chat GBT. Yeah, I've, I've played around with it. Um, yeah, so it's an AI, an AI tool that you can, ask a question of or give a problem to and it it creates you a document or an answer uh, i actually did something for my own house i said write me marketing material on this address and it came out with a fairly impressive description of the home based on publicly available information um its downsides at the moment are I think the database of information that it uses only goes up to 2021. And they start looking a bit familiar because I also did other addresses to see how different they'd be. And it, it did pick up the key points, but it looked remarkably familiar to the one that it, it wrote for me. So it's got its shortcomings. Um, but if you need something quickly, um, and you, you could ask what would be the monthly payment on a, you know, on a mortgage amount with a certain percentage uh, interest rate and it will give you the answer pretty quickly so it, it's it's what college kids are using to to write essays oh. but you can spot them eventually somebody put a question there what is chat gbt and chat gbt is artificial intelligence that um is really it, it seems like it's like the arms race of uh, technology now it might even be replacing like you know instead of google something did you chat that right I mean, in five years, we might just be saying, hey, did you did you GBT that, right, instead of Google it? So hey, so Rob, you get, I, I use it. It's like I'm like the scarecrow in The Wizard of Oz. I finally have a brain, and it's called Jet, this chat. So okay. earlier today, I just, how many residential home sales were in? You can't do 2022 because it stopped at 2021. So when I did 2022, it says we don't have the information. Check the National Association of Realtors. So I changed it to 2021. How many residential home sales were in, 20, in 2021 in the state of Florida? Two seconds later, it comes back. According to the latest data from the Florida Realtor, there were a total of 370,670 closed residential sales in Florida in 2021. That represents a 17.6% increase over the total number of closed sales in 2020, in 2020 of 314,000. I was just amazing. It's written emails for me. It's written letters for me. It's just unbelievable. You put in your key points, and it just writes it all out perfectly. What was so, the name? What was the name of that uh, GPT? It's called. It's called Chat GPT. GPT. And it's free. And I see Danielle. It's free Coyle, for now. I see yeah. Danielle Coyle used it for. Um, you said blogs. Let me just read what she put. Script. Use it for video scripts and blogs. Um, so it, it, it's a it's a future technology to keep your eye on. Um, and uh, I want to just uh, wrap out, uh, com complete the um, the promo. Uh, for yes, Maria. So um, if we could just go back to open houses just for a couple of seconds. I built my entire profession on open houses um and what irked me was when at the end of the day agents would say oh i only had no nosy neighbors well i would be jumping for joy if i had a nosy neighbor come to my open house because i eventually would get them as sellers I will be doing an open house workshop. It'll be two hours long. Uh, look out for the training uh, schedule. Um, I'm trying to figure out what day is best, but I built my entire business on open houses. 
done the right way, like you're saying, getting ready for it and working it through before, during, and after. But I, I find it an amazing, amazing lead generator. That's all. So um, I see, is that Julian um, from uh, Parkland on? I don't know if you're able to uh, to talk. I'm just looking for somebody, uh, some of the people that have had some really uh, positive uh, results from door knocking. But um, in in um, the material that I'm creating in the questions, um, you know what I think determines um, whether the door gets opened or not? What's that? It, it's the, the smile on your face and the way that you, if you look warm and welcoming, they're going to open the door. 100% of the time. If you look warm and welcoming and you have a pleasing personality, even if it's the president of the HOA, you know, telling you to get out of the area, you just say, hey, you know, I'm just trying to help somebody here sell their house. Who else do you know? And you completely flip that around. Okay. So it starts with the same principles of having that pleasing personality and being of service. Um, that's what makes the difference. And Julian, you, you've been doing a fair bit of door knocking, right? Yes, sir. And uh, how many listings have you gotten in the past year? Do you keep track of that or your team? Um, I haven't kept track of it, but um, it's um, it, it's the we found this to be the best way to to prospect because you actually belly to belly with people, just having conversations, and then even if it's not a listing, it's a it's a sale that they're referring you to somebody else. Yep. And um, <clears throat> thank you for sharing, Julian. I know that you've been successful with your team. Um, the, third, the, um, the third way would be like going around to just listed or just sold that may or may not have been ours. Uh, if it's ours or our office, it's better. And you have uh, targeting FISBOs and expireds, and then you just have you know, what I'd call random ninja door knocking, saying, hey, I want to just stop in this neighborhood and, and just randomly go door knocking. And all of them have pluses and minuses um, and minor pivots on the scripts. But the um, you know, having that pleasing personality and smiling is what really determines whether the person, when they look through the window, actually opens the door. Um, so anyway, that's a little plug for Monday. Getting back to um, our, our experience here. So here, here's a mindset uh, shift. Um, how about if we think of our database as an asset, right? And when people look at assets, they look at, well, what does that asset yield, right? And we talk about what would an asset yield um, in real estate, it's the cap rate, right? Like how much percentage are you going to get return for your particular investment? And I think we should look at our database as a, the same way we look at a financial investment is what's my yield going to be on the prior relationships that I've built. And we should be able to, to put a, a monetary or a number on how that asset's going to return. And, and to get that return, you know, um, we need to make certain investments in it to keep in touch and keep relevant, right? But our database is truly an asset, okay? And if we think of it that way, we should expect a certain amount of, of our business to be coming from that asset that, that we spent, in many cases, years or decades to build, right? Um always make experiences worthy of referrals and repeatable business. And um, here's a, another integration to some of the things that we talked about is, how about having case studies, right? Because those of us who have been in the business more than three years, okay, we all have um, examples of transactions that we put together um, that, probably defy logic and odds where we've been able to help somebody when we didn't think we could. We we're able to get an offer accepted when there were, you know, 30 other offers. We were able to get a home sold when there were some issues with the property. Um, we've been able to, you know, 
communicate through divorces and um, estates and death and everything. We we just provide a value to a situation. And I think if we had you know case studies, and you know I know I'm going to give a shout out to the Baker team who put a studio in uh, our Morristown office in the basement, and they're committed to doing a, a lot of videos. And what would be more awesome than if you went out there and you had, you know, a sheet and on your, on your sheet, you had, you know, a real experience about somebody and maybe even a QR code where there was a link to a, a YouTube video saying well, what a positive experience that was, right? Most people probably wouldn't, wouldn't click on it and watch the video, but, you know, um, <clears throat> I don't know anybody that's that's out there doing that, right? Everybody has, you know, different strategies on video, but I think a lot of times the right people don't see the videos, which is kind of a, a real shame. Um, and that's all part of the experience. And if you have, you know, that client experience, right, where you're, um, you've done a great job, and let's say that somebody's in the house for 15 years, Right? Do you think that over time that experience kind of gets forgotten a little bit every year? Would you agree with that? I'm falling too. So, so if that happens, you know, here's a great way to reinforce it. Um, it's to uh, Maria. Can you just mute yourself? I think we hear background. So, um, I think a way to reinforce that is to do like a client event, right, where other people are talking about the experience they had six months ago or a year ago. And you get a bunch of um, satisfied customers in a common uh, in a common activity, or they were attending one event, and the only thing they have in common is that they've all had a positive experience from us. Right? Does anybody know what a call a live call on Zillow costs? You want to make a guess, like from to? Who's spending some money on Zillow? Who's looked at that number? Anybody? So in, in, in the areas that we've invested in, it's between $250 and $1,200 for a live transfer. You can, you can service a lot of clients for your monthly Zillow bill. And those are actually people who like us. Right? Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Pro, can I ask you uh, a question? Eric? Go ahead, go ahead, I'm just trying to. So, so have you done client appreciation events? Never, never have. Never have. I'm anti-social. I, I don't like to socialize with people. <laughs> but that, but but that, that's that's um by definition false because you were invited to a client event with other clients at it, right? You went to your clients for the Super Bowl. I know that firsthand. Oh, okay. Right. right? So, but I mean, um, if you were to um you know, call expired and FISBOs who don't know you. I've heard that sometimes people aren't pleasant on the phone because they get too many calls. But if you associate yourself with past clients that you've done with clients, I don't want to use the term past clients, clients that you've previously served, um, the majority of them, if not the totality of them, are going to have positive things to say. And I think that if we were to do a, hey, you know, come on over to an event and you dropped, you know, two or three thousand dollars or a thousand dollars, or maybe even got a lender and a title partner to help you do it. You're gonna have you're gonna have people talking about you. You're gonna reinforce that experience that you gave and get more business. I don't see how it would not be possible for you to do that. Yet a lot of us choose to just, you know, burn our credit card on Zillow because it's easy or because everybody does it. Rob, can I share something? Absolutely. So I just wanted to share in my uh, numerous years of being in sales roles, 
I did a large amount of client appreciation events. And I ha- I would like to share with everyone, they were absolutely valuable and they always brought more business. One of the key things I did that really made it, you know, kind of kicked up to the next level to benefit everyone was I always told them to bring someone with them that didn't know me. And then at that event, create an experience. So not only was it an event when, you know, there was food and drink and celebration, but I created an event that would be memorable and they had a positive experience and I made everybody feel really good. And when people feel really good, they want to do business with you. And it was definitely a win-win and got a good, a good return. And, you know, when I say create an event, um, one of the things that comes to mind, like uh, off the top of my head was that Halloween time, I rented a bus, we had food, we had drink and we all went as a group to like a haunted house event. So, you know, they then went back and talked about the experience and they felt that experience. And every time they saw me, it brought them warm, fuzzy feelings and more people wanted to do business with me. And it gave me an opportunity to build trust and loyalty. Um, So I have to say, I've always seen a really great return on client events. Thank you. All right. Thanks, thanks for sharing, Denise. And Denise is with our insurance affiliate, We Insure. Um, so here, here's, an, here's an interesting, Robert, did you have something to say? I was just going to mention that over the years, I did um, very small, like 10 couples um, to a uh, cocktail party in my home. Uh, these were client pet, these were clients of mine who during that year, um, had done transactions with me. And it was really, you know, for me, it was a great experience because I walked from room to room and just heard people, you know, very excitedly talking to other people about how great uh, their experience was with me. And since I limited it to, you know, 10 couples, it, it wasn't that expensive to do, um, but it really was very uh, well received and helped build business. Yep. Um, yeah. So I think if we do what everybody else has done, like we're going to be, you know, we're going to be kind of stuck in a range of what everybody else is, uh, is expecting to have. And I think we need to elevate, you know, the business that we have and, um, you know, stop trying to chase the, the shiny pennies and start embracing the people who um, who are going to go to bat for us, who have the ability to help us grow our business. Because uh, excuse me, I had an agent that did a meet your neighbor event. After they sold the house, uh, about two weeks after, they sent out invitations at the you know whoever the um, buyer wanted plus invitations to people in the neighborhood to come and meet your neighbor for um, wine and cheese party. And it was very successful because you got to meet other people in the neighborhood who are possibly thinking of selling. And the interesting thing, um, like Colleen, we all have these, we hear about these great ideas and um, I'm convinced that, you know, you could take the most successful agent in any one of our markets and if you had an honest interview with them and you recorded their day and people saw exactly what they did, it would be hard to replicate. Do you know what I mean? Like there's no secrets in this business is what I'm saying is it's all about the execution, right? It's the commitment to doing. It's not finding the knowledge. It's the commitment to having the the fortitude to go and do that. That's, a, that's another great idea, right? You know, they would appreciate. Hard to or not hard to replicate. It's very hard to replicate because because it's not about knowing what to do, Maurice. It's about having the um, the skills and the uh, discipline and the personality to go through it all, right? Okay, like you can watch. It's it's almost like saying like I think we think that if we knew what the secret was that somebody else did to do a hundred million dollars in business that we can just copy that playbook and execute it. But that would be as ridiculous as um, saying, hey, you know, um, 
I, I saw um, Tom Brady as a quarterback, and I'm just going to I'm going to throw the ball the same way he does. It, it's it's just not possible, right? It's about you'd have to go back and and do all the things that need to get you there, and um, you know doing you know doing a uh, a meet the neighbor event. I'm going to guess that probably we have we have 78 people on the call. I'm going to guess that there's less than three people that have actually done a mailing and say meet your new neighbor. You know, is there any is there anybody that's done that on this call directly? I have. Okay, we have one. But I think it's a great Shante, I think it's a great idea. You know, whatever that investment was, if you were creative, you could probably, you know, if you referred that to an attorney and uh, a title company and a mortgage rep, you could probably even get them to help underwrite the expense and be there because guess what? They're gonna grow their business from that same event. I mean, we just think we, we just think like everybody else has thought over the time and it limits where we can grow to. Okay. So <clears throat> I can't believe how quick these go by. Um, we we're already at 1035. Um, I hope to see um, those of you who are available. It is during R4 for the um, Monday mastermind. Uh, we'll have four of your peers on there. Excuse me, not mastermind, the peer to peer on door knocking scripts, what people are doing um, and give you a little bit of insight so that if that's something that you want to incorporate into your um, book of business, you know, you'll have some peers that are sharing with you exactly what they've experienced, the good, the bad, the challenges and the benefits. Okay. Um, and for me, I was, I, I did say last um, Monday, I was going to cancel it, but it turns out that I can still do it because it's going to be 6.30 a.m. in Las Vegas and the R4 won't even be started yet. So I just get up a little bit earlier and we'll have that event. So uh, if you're not at R4, come join us on Monday. If you're at, at R4 and you don't have too much to drink the night before, maybe you can pop on. Have a great weekend, everybody. Uh, one more thing. When are you doing the... Um the group that's dealing with the, um, the listing. Yes. 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 So, um, great. Um, I have, uh, New Jersey for, <clears throat> is going to work on Shante. You wanted to do the Fizbos, right? Yes. And then our team in Florida, um, I'm going to send a communication out to try to put together a, um, postcard series for, uh, expired. Yeah. And, um, hopefully we can have that done within the next 10 days, okay? We'll, we'll, we'll try to get that um, connection made. And uh, that's my bad. I was uh, I have everybody's list right here. I just have to connect everybody together. And Shante, you are gonna do something today at four with- uh, Me one and Jean Marie are gonna meet today at four. So I'll get an email out for everybody in New Jersey if they want to you know, maybe call in and whatnot. And um, I think, Colleen, I'm going to um, copy you on everybody in Florida to try to work on the expireds. All right. Hey, Rob. Hey, Rob. Um, Rob. Yes. Uh, last thing, if anybody would like any ideas for client appreciation events, being I've got 20 plus years in doing them, just an idea, a topic, um, they are more than welcome to give me a call and I'd be happy to share some ideas with them. Uh, look, all from a whole variety. Yep. Fantastic. Rob, Rob, also, I wanted to mention that I'm introducing the RAMP program to everyone in the Parkland office March 15th from 1 o'clock till about 3 o'clock. So anyone who wants to um, hear about RAMP and come aboard, um, that'll be on uh, March 15th at the Parkland office here in Florida. Okay, Denise, can you put your contact info in the chat for the people who are still on asking for it? And then... Um, are any uh, anybody doing the ramp in New Jersey that want to you know give a, a comment positive or negative about how that's been working for you? I can chime in real quick. Um, I've been doing it. Uh, we started it about uh, six weeks ago, I guess, or five weeks ago. It's um, it's been a great refresher course for me. Um, Lots of good nuggets of information, great tips, technique, um, just a really, really good, uh, good way to uh, get back on the horse as well. 
and and great uh, content. Rob, Rob Durso, like one might say, you've been doing this for 37 years. Why do you need to go? You know, I, I feel like, you know, you can only absorb so much at any given time. And the older you get, the more you forget. Um, so I, I feel like it's a great refresher. It's a great way to reinvigorate your, uh, your experience. Um, and I just, I think like to your point earlier about continuous learning, um, it's important. Constant never ending improvement. Right. So, um, if you're in Florida uh, and Ron, it, it's the same we did up here in, uh, in New Jersey, right? If you register you want to just uh, explain how that works okay well if you want to register uh it's going to start here in florida april 1st so it's um one day a week that you have to attend from one to three uh it'll be on a friday but there are other, other uh, curriculums that you need to follow through the ramp program which i'll explain on the uh, 15th of march to everyone that wants to uh, be a part of it um i took the course and believe me, it's, it is uh, incredible. And the agents will definitely close two deals or more if they stick with it. And and is Fazia picking up the tab if they go through the course? Is Fazia picking up the tab? Right. And it's 300, like in New Jersey, it was $300 to sign yes, up. Yes, it's, it, it's $300 it, it, per person. It'll be, they'll be billed for it. If they complete the course, they get the $300 refunded back. So there, there's commitment. To you we're, we're investing in you we just want you to do the work so basically if you intend to do it um it's free um if you don't follow through it it does uh you pick up the tab so i i thank everybody that's exciting news ron i know you've been helping a lot of people sometimes i go into the offices in new jersey i see people on zooms with you so um and they continue to attend so it must be good stuff and um you know we're just trying to to give you some discipline and some fresh ideas so that you can continue to grow because either you're growing or you're dying. So everybody have a great weekend. And um, if you're at R4, I'll see you there. If not, uh, hope to see you on the Monday peer to peer on door knocking. Take care, everybody.